Good morning, welcome here to uh, Burvey. Um, if you're a guest or a visitor, I see there's a couple with us this morning, um, you're very welcome, you're amongst friends. Uh, my name is Andrew and I have the great privilege of being a minister and we hope that you are blessed as you worship alongside us. A couple of things to mention by way of notices before we um, begin our time together. Um, first up is that tomorrow we've got a coffee morning um, from 10 to 11 in here. Um, and a coffee morning's um, where they're all free, you can come along, you don't have to spend any money at all. If you want to give any money that's raised will be going towards um, the work of the church. So please do invite family and friends along to that. And a few of you had promised to bake, and I might not have got back to you. Please do bake, otherwise it'll be me running across to buy some chocolate biscuits in the morning. So um, if you're not baked and you'd still like to bake, please do. Um, that'd be very, very handy. If you want to come and help, again, we'd love to have your help for that. Um, and also there's going to be a coffee morning in uh, a week on Tuesday. Um, on, can't work it, it's 14th, um, Tuesday the 14th because 30, told you I could work it. My child kept me up four hours last night, so that's my yeah. excuse. Um, uh, next Tuesday is show of Tuesday, pancake Tuesday, call it what you wish, and the schools happen to be off, at least here in Bervey are off um, at the beginning of that week, and we thought we'd take advantage of that and say to all the young folk in the community, come along, get free chocolate spread and a pancake. Um, bring your mums and dads and Peter is going to be leading that coffee morning um, again any funds raised uh, will be going towards the work of the Samaritan charity Peter's been volunteering with them uh, for a number of years and a, a worthy cause of course so tomorrow 10 to 12 and also next Tuesday 10 to 12 as well and um, both are free but any mon money raised and um, going towards uh, those charities uh, two more things to say uh, Margaret's going to have a notice now Um, I just want to give an advance notice about the World Day of Prayer, which uh, I seem to be um, not exactly in charge of. We've got a little steering group, myself and Liz and Alison Robertson from St David's, and it's um, to be held on Friday, March the 1st um, at 2 o'clock in here. And uh, the World Day of Prayer has been running for many, many years, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great service to come to because people the world over are praying on that day. And this year, it's been prepared by the WPP Committee of Palestine. And it's a beautiful service. And I just would like to encourage you to come to that, if you will. And uh, I'm just on the lookout for some readers. Just let me know. <laughs> but um, I, I just want to read to you. One of the, we always finish with the hymn, Thou, the day thou gavest, Lord, is ended. It's been a tradition for years. And let me just read this verse to you because it's just wonderful. As all each continent and island, the dawn leads on another day. The voice of prayer is never silent, nor dies the strain of praise away. So the world over, I pray, on that day, it's a wonderful thing that so many people in so many different countries are actually doing this service. So I would encourage you to come to that. Thank you. Andrew? Yeah, just continuing on the theme of world mission, um, you might know that uh, as a church we sponsor a child in Uganda uh, called Abuas. And his his birthday in a couple of months' time, uh, obviously with how long it takes to post up to Uganda, we need to uh, have the stuff sent off fairly quickly. So um, it's his 22nd birthday, and I thought it might be quite nice for uh, us as a church to sign him a birthday card. So I bought him a card, and I'm going to leave it, uh, leave it on the table outside in the church centre. So if you'd like to, feel free to sign it with a wee message, and we'll get that sent off. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more thing to say is, if you've got children or grandchildren, um, um, anywhere in Scotland who don't have to live locally, um, then Scripture Union, which we have a, a group here, which Sheila, um, Caroline, myself run, and our holiday clubs every year are kind of through Scripture Union. Um, there's camps, um, all kinds of camps that take place over Easter holidays and also over the summer holidays, um, ranging from kind of just simple things like doing some archery and things like that, right up to kind of surfing and quad biking and all this kind of things. Um, we told some of our kids on Tuesday at SU Group for primary school kids about the camps. They're like, oh, I can't wait to go surfboarding. We're like, 
Sorry, that's for the old kids. Um, but one day you'll get there. Um, but um, if you have a kid or grandkid or, or a neighbour or friend who um, is anywhere between primary five up to S6, um, there'll be a camp for them. And if you can't afford it or if there's financial trouble, there's a bit in the back that says, don't worry, SU um, can maybe help you out with the cost there. But there's lots going on. Please do go along. For many of us, it was a real developmental time in our faith. Um, or when I went as a leader, it was a great time for me. Um, if you want to help serve on, um, folk will be very glad to serve. There's even one starting this year that's all about kind of playing on Playstations and things. So you think you can send your, camp away, your kid away to camp to get off the TV screens, but no, they're going to play even more games. But they're going to learn about Jesus and uh, to follow him while they're there too. So we come to worship our God and our King, and indeed we gather together to worship the one who made us, the one who calls us, the one who equips us, the one who loves us without end. And so with joyful hearts, let us worship our God. We're going to stand and sing if we're able, and we'll sing our opening praise to God be the glory. The words are on the screen. him in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we gladly come to you and surrender our life to you and declare to you be all the glory. To you be all the glory, all the honour, all the power, the wisdom and might. For you are the, the most wonderful, the most glorious of gods. You're above every other being in all of creation, higher than the angels, more magnificent than, than us, more full of splendor and, and, and life and joy than even the most wonderful of animals. 
Lord, we look up into the night sky and we see um, all of the galaxies and stars. And even then we don't see them all. Our most powerful telescopes into the solar system have not seen them all. And Lord, we recognize that you're the one who holds the whole of the universe in the palm of your hands. You hold all of that in the palm of your hands and yet out of all of that, you see that we are your most treasured possession. That we are the ones in whom you take the most delight. We thank you that you have rescued us. That you've brought us out of darkness into your light. That you've called us and made us into your sons and daughters. You make us your treasured possession. Loved with an everlasting love. Never to be cast aside. Never to be put to shame. But instead treasured and held close. For you have sent Jesus to live, to die and rise again for us. That we might be saved. That we might have everlasting life. That we might have a fresh start time and time again. So God, as we come to worship you, whether we are young or old, whether we have full faith or we're just beginning to have faith, might we treasure you in finding you life and joy, hope and peace. Be with us as we sing these anthems of praise. Be with us as we turn to you in prayer, giving us full and trusting hearts. Help us to listen to your word and what you have to say to us. For we come together as your people. And we gather up our prayers in the people of Jesus and in his words that we say together. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. big question for us all what's who's the most important person that you've ever received a letter from well how about we start with you have you ever received a, an important letter or the, if you had a letter that you kept or a card that you kept what kind of who would it might be from that you'd like i want to keep that letter that's a really important or special letter to me from mum mum dad or maybe from grandparents who might have sent you one saying merry christmas or happy birthday yeah Anyone else who's got, any, anyone else that's quite important in their life that if you've got a letter from? None of you have ever received a letter, fair enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> my, my class got a letter from David Valley. Yeah. Yeah. They were very excited. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> so Jane's, uh, class, at, Jane's class at school received uh, a letter from a celebrity, yeah? Mm-hmm. Margaret? There you go. Okay. Letter. There you go. Anyone else? Yeah, Sheila? There you go. Yeah, a few, a few, a few of you have been to maybe garden parties and received one um, from uh, the Queen. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, maybe from a loved one. Maybe in Valentine's Day in a couple of weeks' time, you might receive one from a loved one or a secret admirer that says, I love you, that you're wonderful. Um, you might receive all these kind of things. Um, a few weeks ago, um, I, I got a couple of letters. It's addressed to me, but it's basically addressed to the church um, from our local MP. And it's got the House of Commons uh, kind of logo on it there from uh, Andrew Bowie, um, our MP. And so, yeah, you might have received um, special letters. Now, Ollie, what do you think? If God's going to write your letter, what would it look like? What might it. Where, or do you think you've got a letter from God? You might have one from grandparents or mum and dad in the house. But do you think I've got, I've got a letter from God in the house? I think you might. Because I think if God should write us a letter, it might look like a Bible. And so it might look like a little children's Bible. We've got one like this in the house um, for, for kind of Caleb. It's kind of very simple. It just tells you in a couple of paragraphs um, the stories of little cute um, uh, pictures. Or it might be a bit older, maybe someone for more Yuri Jolly, where it's um, a bit more detailed and it's got, again, illustrations in it. And for most of us, 
We maybe don't need pictures, maybe you do, but um, many of us, I guess, when we get to adulthood, we've got a kind of a regular Bible that's kind of a bit more boring in terms of it doesn't have the pictures in it, but it's all of the, all of the Bible that God writes out for us. And you can get the Bible um, also in an audio book. So sometimes I'm walking along out with a dog and you can listen to the Bible on your phone or on your, your music player, or you can, yeah, you can get Bible in Braille for those who are blind. You can read the Bible in Braille and it's written in lots of different languages too. And that's kind of like God's really special letter to each of us. Now, Ollie, that kind of letter you might have from mum and dad or from grandparents or other folk, have you just shoved it in a box filled with lots of other rubbish? Have you shoved it at the bottom of the bin and put loads of like old food on top of it and things? <laughs> or what, where, what kind of thing would you do with your, your special letter you got from someone that you care about? Is it kind of kept nice and safe? Yeah, because you, 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 you think this person's really important and I want to maybe read it again, I want to keep it nice and safe. And it's the kind of thing we do because when we treasure someone's letters, um, yeah, we keep them safe, but also we want to look at them time and time again. And that's what we do in the Bible too. We say, God, this is your letter to me, whether it looks like this, whether it looks like this, or something else. God, it's your letter to me and I want to treasure it and learn and read it again and again and again and find out more about you and remember why you love me or why mum and dad love you or why grandparents love you or whoever else it might be that wrote you a special letter or if the Queen loves you and then she might have written a letter to you too. But <laughs> special letters, um, we treasure, we keep safe. And the Bible, it's not so much I'm saying keep the Bible safe that you can't, yeah, you've got to keep it in a special box or anything, but rather it's a place, it's something that God wants for you to read time and time again because he loves you. And in the Bible, it tells us all about how much God loves us and wants us to have a really good life, a life filled with love and joy and hope and peace. And so I would encourage all of you, whether your Bible at home looks like this or like this, whether you listen to an audio Bible, whether it's, you can even get comic book Bibles now, whatever your Bible looks like, I want to encourage you to, to read it. And read it not just to get information in your head and go, I've learned 10 things about the Bible, but read it almost like a letter of love from God saying, God, I love, God loves you, that God wants you to have the best life possible. The same way a letter from parents or loved ones or grandparents would say, I love you, you're special to me. And that's why you keep that letter and you've treasured it at home. We shall pray and then we'll sing again. Loving God, we thank you that you don't just write us a, a wee short letter that we can um, shove away in the box. But in fact, you have written us a, a big gigantic letter in the Bible. And thank you that letter was written filled with your amazing love for us. And in that book, you tell us all about what it is to, to know you, to follow you, to have life and joy, hope and peace all throughout our life. And so we pray that we would um, see the Bible kind of like a love letter from you. That we would read it time and time again, remembering how much you love us and how much you want us to, to live life to the full. Lord, thank you that you give us a Bible in all different kinds of formats for all different kinds of ages and stages of life. And we pray that we be people who learn to love the Bible and learn to love the God who writes it to us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are going to sing again. And the priest is going to lead us in a song called From the Breaking of the Dawn.
Margaret's going to come up and read for us um, a couple of portions from the New Testament from Luke chapter 24 from verse 13 to 27 and then John chapter 5 from verse 31. Last week we began a a little series, a five week series, um, exploring what it is to be a disciple and we called it Becoming because God wants us, us to be becoming more and more like Jesus. That's what being a disciple is all about. And so last week we looked at worship, that we worship God, not just on Sunday mornings when we sing a handful of songs, but we're called to worship God in all of our life, in the way we speak and interact and and spend time with others and love our neighbour, love our enemies. All of that is to be worshipped, that we say, God, you deserve all of my life and I give you all of my life. So we, we become more like Jesus as we worship God in all of life. And today we want to be people who are discovering Jesus and learning to be like him as we turn to, as that song was saying, um, looking at every promise of God's word. And so we've got Bible with you, or if not, it's on the screen. Um, But Luke chapter 24 from verse 13, then John chapter 5 from verse 31. The first one is on the road to Emmaus, which is one of my all-time favourite passages of scripture, so I'm so pleased I'm reading it. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And now we have a short reading from John's Gospel, which is chapter 5 beginning at verse 31. This is called Testimonies About Jesus. It's Jesus speaking. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. There is another who testifies in my favour, and I know that his testimony about me is valid. You have sent to John and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than that of John. For the very work that the Father has given me to finish and which I am doing, testifies that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself 
testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Amen. I think we all know as Christians that the Bible, that God's word is important, but I think we always need that reminder time and time again just how important it is and how valuable it is if we're going to be those folk who are becoming more and more like Jesus, who are growing as disciples. So this morning I want to outline three reasons why I think engagement with the Bible, not just on Sunday mornings, but on a personal level in your own time, is so important if we're going to make strides in our faith. You could say the Bible almost acts like, or our engagement with it, acts like a barometer, revealing whether we are thriving or perhaps dying in our spiritual life. So three reasons why the Bible is central to our growth as followers of Jesus. And the first is that the scriptures, that the Bible is true. Christians believe that God's word is in fact the words of God. In 2 Timothy 3, we read that famous um, bit where Paul mentions what the Bible is, and he says that the the Holy Scriptures, the Bible from beginning to end, are divinely inspired by God. Or the phrase that we sometimes see, depending on your translation, is God breathed. In other words, God breathed life into these words that are not like words in any other book or bit of literature. They are somewhat different. In the same way that God breathed life into Adam and Eve, or breathe life into that valley of dry bones that Ezekiel saw. God breathes life in a special, powerful way into these words that you can read in anywhere else. There's ordinary words, but together they are God's words. But the Bible also says that humans wrote the Bible. There was humans just like you and just like me who wrote this book. But behind the scenes, God was working through the Holy Spirit, causing it to come to pass in such a way that Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, whoever else it was, wrote bits of the Bible in such a way that God would like it to be exactly like that. And that God would preserve it so that we would still have the Bible in the same way 2,000 years later on. Now you might say that some pieces of art or orchestral symphonies or spellblinding films are inspired. You might say, oh, that was an inspiring bit of work. But they're utterly breathtaking in other words. Mm-hmm. But scripture is a real deal. It really is divinely inspired like nothing else. And so when you read the Bible, no matter what bit of it, you're not just reading some old fairy tales or some good moral stories or ancient narratives. You're reading what your creator, the universe's creator, in his unfathomable wisdom has said, I want this to be preserved so that you and you and you and me could read today. So that you could come to know God, love him and find life in his name. God's word is God's words for us. As I say, the Bible is true and Jesus says that. He says in a prayer to his father, your word is truth, he says to God. The book of Numbers says that God is not a man that he should lie. In other words, you lie, I lie, but God never lies. What he says is always true. Titus, in the book of Titus, we see that because God is true and pure, he cannot lie. The Bible from beginning to end is God's truth for us. But in our modern culture, in our kind of relativist culture that we've grown into in the last couple of decades at least, or if not longer than that, you might hear the kind of phrase, something along the lines of, well that's your truth, but my truth is different. Now, in some ways, that's perfectly fine. It might be your truth that you prefer a chippy to an Indian takeaway. For a show of hands, we all have a different truth as to what our favourite takeaway or favourite food might be. Or if I was to ask you, what's your favourite show on telly? Some of you would say, well, my truth is Strictly Come Dancing. Others would say, I love watching BBC politics. Whatever it might be. I imagine not, but it might be. (laughs) 
Others might say, I love comedy panel shows or whatever else it might be. And that would be your truth. And that's perfectly fine. But you try arguing before a court judge along those kind of lines. Judge, it might be your truth that driving through Bervy should be limited to 30 miles per hour. But my truth, judge, is that 75 miles per hour <laughs> is the correct. And I was only going at 74. So I was perfectly fine. Because my truth is that 75 miles per hour is fine. But, bear, but judge, your truth is it's 30. <coughs> Doesn't matter what you think, judge. I believe my truth. You wouldn't get away with that. Of course you wouldn't. Some things, many things in life, are just unquestionably true. Again, you could say, well, I'm going to come to worship here at church at two o'clock on a Saturday morning. Fine, you do that. No one else will be here. It might be your truth, but you're wrong. It might be your truth that Berlin is the capital of France. It's your truth, but you're wrong. Many of these things are not a matter of culture or preference but they're just true. And the Bible is like that too. It's true because it's not made up by humans, but it's the words of God. And so the Bible is not a sweetie shop where you can pick and choose, well, I want a bit of that and a bit of that. And I don't like that, so I'm not going to pick that. Although it's tempting to do that because how often do we come to bits of the Bible that make us uncomfortable? Love my enemies. Be generous with all of my possessions and time and talents. Or God calls you to believe things or do things that go against the culture of our day. It's easy to want to pick and choose. But the Bible is true. So it's not a sweetie shop. Rather it's a signpost that says this way. This way to life. To God's fullness and blessing. To discovering the reason why you were made by your creator. Now of course you can go against that. You can say I know the sign says go north for Aberdeen. But I choose to go south. You can do that but you'll end up frustrated. You'll not get to your destination. And like that with the Bible. God says go this way. But you can choose to abandon that. And it won't lead to that abundant life. That fulfillment, that joy, that peace that God wants for you. God's message in the Bible is true for all of us. And so if we want to grow to be more like Jesus. We want to be victorious in our life. We must base our life on that foundation of not a pick and choose. But real truth. And linked to that, scripture is a standard by which we live. The essence to being a disciple is that we want to be more and more like Jesus with God's help and grace along the way. Jesus is a teacher, we're the pupils. He's a master, we are the followers. He's the expert, we're the novices. So being a disciple is choosing day by day to be more like Jesus in how we speak, how we love, how we interact, everything else. But if you're going to be more like Jesus today or tomorrow, then you've got to know what he was like. You need to know who he was, what he did, what he lived like, how he spoke and all the rest. You need a pattern, a manual, a way to measure your life by it. And you read the Bible and you see that Jesus was generous. And you say, God, I want to be like Jesus, so help me be more generous. And God will help you. You see that Jesus was incredibly wise. And so God will help you as you follow him to be more wise. You should, we, are find, we find out in the Bible that Jesus depended on the Spirit's power, not his own power, but the Spirit's power to, to make him do all that he wanted, God wanted him to do. And as we follow Jesus, God will help us to not rely upon ourselves, but trust more and more in the Spirit's power in our lives. And when you turn to the Old Testament, then you see a pattern of what it is to be a perfect person. What it is to live a perfect life. Of course none of us do that. But the pattern is lined out there for us. The Ten Commandments are a great summary of it. There's so much more. But it's a great start. And when you get to Jesus. He fulfills all of that. And he lives a perfect life in every moment of his life. And so when you come to read Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. The gospel accounts. You come face to face with a man who never sinned. Not once. Who never lied. Never got proud, was never jealous, was never selfish, was never greedy, but rather always filled with love and joy, peace and hope and all the fruit of the Spirit and so on. In fact, he was killed not because he was bad or evil, but because folk could find nothing else than to make up charges against him. So Jesus lived a perfect life. He shows us how we should live if we were to be perfect. We don't do that, but more and more we want to. We depend more on God's Spirit. We trust more and more in him. 
So God gives us in the Bible what it is to be a follower of Jesus. And that means that if our lives are not aligned with the Bible, then it's not the Bible that's wrong, it's you or me that's wrong. And so it might be a case of today or tomorrow this week, um, you come face to face with a situation where it's easy or you want to lie. But you know the Bible says, do not lie. There's no ambiguity in that. The Bible says, do not lie. But you're like, well, it's convenient if I tell my boss that I've done the job, but actually I'll hopefully finish it by five o'clock today. It's convenient and it's easy. And it's tempted to do that, but the Bible says, do not lie. It's not the Bible that's wrong, it's us that are wrong. The Bible is the ultimate rock by which we build our life upon, the unchanging source of life and truth. As I say, it's tempting to put the Bible aside. That's what sin is. It's saying, God, you told me not to lie, but it's convenient to lie in this time. And it's not a big lie. I'm not cheating the government out of millions of pounds. I'm just telling my boss a small white lie and I'll do the job later on today, or whatever else it might be. But even when it's tough, we're to come back to that understanding that this book is God's manual for your life almost. It's God's Heavenly Father's message to you. It's God's words for you. So what the Bible says goes. When it speaks, we shouldn't argue or negotiate or look for a loophole, as tempting as it is certainly for me. But instead, we're called to bend the knee, submit and say, God, it's tough. But yes, Lord, your word is true. God's word is an ultimate authority for your life and my life. And if we want to live that rich, fulfilling life that Jesus died and rose to give you, then let the Bible be that plumb line which directs and determines the boundaries of your life. Don't come to the Bible saying, my way. But come to the Bible and say, God, it's your way. You let you shape me and change me more into the likeness of Jesus. And thirdly, the, the word of God points us to Jesus. If you want to know Jesus, like really know him, like know him in the same way that you know a loved one or a friend or someone else here today, and not just as an idea or a historical figure or an acquaintance you bump into for an hour on Sunday morning, but you want to really know him, you need to get to know the Bible. If you want to experience Jesus as a trusted friend you can rely on in your struggles, a God you can passionately worship, a God who walks beside you in your struggles and sorrows and in the grief, you need to get into the Bible. For that's why the Bible exists. The Bible is not there for information like a car manual. The Bible is there so that you might know Jesus more. All of it, from the letters that Paul writes and others write, to the historical accounts of the kings and chronicles and so on, to the bits of poetry and the Psalms or the wisdom and Proverbs and everything else. All of that is to allow you and me to know Jesus more. Not know about Jesus like 10 things here is to know about Jesus, but know him in a way that you know a friend or a loved one or whoever else it might be. Now to be clear, the Bible is not Jesus. Sometimes you get Christians who can we just overstep the mark and they turn the Bible into the thing to worship. That's not quite the case. We don't worship the Bible, but we worship the God who's revealed in and through the Bible. And so we don't use this book like some kind of magic uh, thing where you, I don't know, you flick the pages of it and the demons run away. Or it's not a thing that's like a, a lucky rabbit's foot that will give you good luck and make you win your 100 metre race if you carry it around. I certainly wouldn't do that if you carry around the Bible. But it's not a lucky charm. It's not some kind of magic thing that can grant you your wishes, but rather it reveals God to you. This book is unlike any other book. I was reading up this week that the British Library that's built over a couple of buildings, at least in the UK, has something like 20 million books in its collection. Some are a few thousand years old, bits of manuscripts and ancient bits of literature right through to new books that are published each and every day in the UK and sometimes around the world too. 200,000 new books every year are added to their collection, 20 million in total, plus hundreds of millions of other bits of um, things as well. But in amongst all of those 20 million books or so, the Bible is unlike any other one of those. Because in amongst all those books will be biographies and autobiographies, will be manuals and textbooks and novels and all the rest. But the Bible is unlike any of them. For not only did God write the book, 
he shows us himself through the book. And so we don't come to the Bible like it's a novel with some great stories or like an academic textbook to gain some knowledge. We come to the Bible to know God and to fall in love with him more and more. As you get into the word, the author of the book shows you Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit does when you read the Bible. He says, here's Jesus. He gives you a signpost. He takes you by the hand and he says, look, there's Jesus. Here's the way, the truth and the life. Here's your king. And so you can come to the Bible for lots of different reasons. You can come to it a bit like I did when I was at university, studying like an academic textbook where here's 10 things that I can tell you about the Bible for my essay. Or you can come to it to prove people wrong. Well, here's what the Bible says, therefore you're wrong to win an argument out of. You come to it out of curiosity. You can come for it, come to it for leisure reading. Read the novel, read the Bible, read Women's Weekly. It's a bit of leisure reading for you. There's plenty of reasons to might come to the Bible. But and amongst all of those and more, we often miss the reason why God gives us this book. Now, turning to the readings that Margaret read for us earlier, first up, um, John chapter 5, Jesus is confronting the Pharisees, these religious leaders. And Jesus confronts them because he says to them, you keep on reading the Bible and you're very good at reading the Bible, but you're missing the point. And look, in, sorry, in John chapter 5, verse 39, he says this really curious statement. You study the scriptures, the Bible, diligently because you think that in them you have everlasting life. But these are the very scriptures that testify about me. In other words, they're doing a great job of learning the Bible, of memorizing the Bible, of knowing the Bible inside out. And they think that because we've done that, we get everlasting life. Jesus says it's a case of missing the wood for the trees. And if you think about it, if those folk were in our church today, we'd be applauding them. Look how good you are at reading the Bible. You know whole chunks of it off by heart. Not just like one or two small verses, but whole books of it. You've memorised it, you know it inside out, you know all the connections and all the different bits of it. You would be celebrating them, I would be celebrating them. But Jesus rebukes them, he tells them off. He says, yes, you're doing the good stuff. You read your Bible every day, you know it off by heart, you're studying it, learning it, knowing everything about it, but you've missed the point of why you're learning it and so on. Spurgeon, the great preacher, said it like this. I may, know all, I may know all the doctrines of the Bible, you may know the Bible inside out, but unless I know Jesus Christ, there is not one of those doctrines that can save me. So don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying that studying the Bible, that learning the Bible, that memorising the Bible is wrong, is a very good thing to do. Head knowledge is vital, but only when and because it should lead you to knowing Jesus more personally. If you study the Bible, but not to get close to Jesus, it's almost of an inferior value to do so. And so if you wanted to go and become an academic lecturer in Old Testament studies and learn whole bits of off by heart and do lectures on it, write books on it, great, and I encourage you to go and do that. But if you stop there for your reason for reading the Bible, it's of little value to your soul. You might win awards, you might write a bestseller, you might be a great academic, but you might know nothing more that's helpful to your soul. I'll give you a real life example of this. Um, I did my theology degree, obviously, for becoming a minister, but before that I did a geography degree in Glasgow University. And as part of that, in your first couple of years, you're encouraged to take a couple of other classes of other subjects. And one of those classes that I did for one year was in the study of theology, learning about the Bible, learning about God. Now, Glasgow University is a secular university. At one time, the, the theology department would have been ministers and preachers, etc. But that's no longer the case. It's a whole mismatch. And so I recall, for instance, having a Muslim teach me about the Bible in one class. And that Muslim, at least in their personal capacity, <coughs> believed that the Bible that they were teaching is filled with errors. For Muslims don't believe that Jesus was God that he died on a cross, or that he was raised back to life. I also had an agnostic or an atheist teach me the Bible, but they were teaching it as almost like it was a Shakespeare play or some other bit of ancient literature, going, 
at some interesting quirks and some in interesting phrases here. And this is how it's changed um, um, our culture and our language throughout the years. But it's not relevant to them other than a bit of academic literature. I had a liberal Protestant who thought that Jesus was, had some great teachings and some great morals, but the Bible was, was largely a mythical account, that much of it, some of the miraculous things, were definitely not true. Lots of great morals, but nothing more than that. But when I went to do my second degree in theological college at Christian University, all of the lecturers, and even the cleaner and the librarian, were Christian. And so I read the exact same Bible as I had four or five years earlier. I sat exams to the exact same rigour and standard, and if not longer and harder than I had a few years earlier. But I was taught the Bible in two completely different ways. Back in Glasgow, it was a bit of ancient literature. Interesting morals, perhaps bits of history, but have no value other than a bit of literature to study here today. But the second time I studied it, it became the living word of God. that lecturers saw it as something to point people to Jesus so that you and I might have life, life in all of its fullness. Yes, it had some interesting morals and snippets of history, but it's so much more than that. One way will get you academically smart, but will do little for your faith. The other way will help you blossom and flourish in faith and you'll become more like Jesus. And so the Bible's not the end goal. Don't come to the Bible to learn it just like a textbook for an exam. Let it be like a signpost, a window saying, here's life to the full. All of it, from beginning to end, is all about Jesus. Jesus says that again in John chapter 5, when he says, the Father who sent me has t testified concerning me. In other words, what you read in the Bible before now is all about me. And Jesus says the same thing in that second passage we read from Luke chapter 24. There's that great story that Jesus is walking with these friends who have heard that Jesus was raised from the dead, but they don't understand it. <laughs> dead people, they know him just as much as you and I know, stay dead. But they've been told by their friends, our friend Jesus, he's back alive. And they're saying, how can this come to pass? How is that possible? Why would it happen? Then Jesus says to them when they ask this guy, Jesus, they don't know it's Jesus yet. They're, they don't realise it's Jesus. They're walking alongside. He says to them in verse 25. How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets. He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. That must have been amazing. A Bible study with Jesus walk along the road with them. But Jesus was not just letting them know 10 facts to know about certain books of the Bible. But he was saying, see this bit of the Bible. It's about Jesus, isn't it? The one that you believe or you've heard has been raised from the dead, the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. This bit in the Old Testament is about Jesus too. Do you not see that? And it's still true. The whole Bible from Genesis 1 to the end is all about Jesus. And maybe you're kind of thinking right now, Andrew, have you not read the Old Testament? I have, and Jesus never mentioned. There's no, not one guy called Jesus in the Old Testament. They never say a man called Jesus will be this high and do this and whatever else. There's no Jesus mentioned in the Old Testament. Well, you're right. The name Jesus never crops up. But here's the kind of things that Jesus might have said to these friends on the road. He might have taken them to Genesis chapter 3, where God says to the serpent... Satan, he says, one of Eve's children or descendants will crush your head, but you will strike his heel. And Jesus might say, is that what happened to this guy, Jesus, that he seemed to crush Satan, that he died, but now he's been raised back to life, but well, he also had to die, that Satan kind of looked like he won first. Or he might have mentioned Moses and said, Moses did that great exodus, the people were free from captivity. But will Jesus... Is he not promised that he will lead people into everlasting freedom? Not from Pharaoh, but from sin forever and ever and ever into the perfect promised land? Is Jesus not like that perfect lamb who will be sacrificed, not every day in the temple, but once and for all? Is Jesus not like a high priest, but a better high priest, who will not die and then be, find another one next time, but rather he will be the final high priest, who will reconcile God to humanity for all people in all time? 
Is Jesus not like the better prophet? The prophets kept on saying, the Messiah is coming. God is on the march. But is Jesus not the one who points people to God because he is God himself? We read about all the kings and so often they fail. They lead people astray. They mess up. But is Jesus not a better king who never leads his people astray? Who takes his people into a kingdom that will be safe and pure and wonderful forever? Is Jesus not the good shepherd or the rock or the refuge, the one worthy of praise as the Psalms speak about? Is Jesus not filled with great wisdom like the Proverbs show? Isaiah says that the Messiah will heal the blind, the lame and the deaf. Jesus did that. The Messiah will be the one who is God with us. Jesus said he was that. That he will die on a cross. Is that not what Jesus did? Well, Hosea, what about him? He, we read in his book, loves his adulterous wife who keeps on committing adultery. But does Jesus not love his disciples and his people ever increasingly, even though they keep on failing him? Jesus is a better Hosea. Or Joel. Joel, we find out from him that Jesus, the king, will give salvation to everyone through faith. That people will receive the Holy Spirit when they come to trust in him. Did Jesus not say he's come to bring life and fullness and salvation? Or what about Jonah? Jonah was in the belly of the whale in the depths of the earth for three days and nights. It's been three days and three nights since Jesus was put in the depths of the earth. What about Zechariah? We find out that the king is coming. He will ride unto Jerusalem in a donkey. That he'll be a priest, that he'll be pierced in his hands. Well, Jesus, he came in about a week or so ago, did he not? On a donkey, being proclaimed as king, and then he died and was pierced on his hands and his feet. All of those things and more Jesus might have said. I could be here for an hour or two pointing out hundreds, if not thousands of ways in which the Bible gives us glimpses of Jesus, our saviour, our king, our prophet and priest. Alistair Begg put it succinctly. We find Jesus in all the scriptures. In the Old Testament, he's predicted. In the Gospels, he's revealed. In Acts, he's preached. In the Apostles, he's explained. In Revelation, he's expected. The Bible is filled with Jesus. And I want to ward off any discouragement because maybe you go home today or tomorrow and you read your Bible and you're reading some part of the probably Old Testament and you're saying, where's Jesus in this story? Well, don't worry. Because not every single verse or even every single chapter clearly segues into something about Jesus. Sometimes we might be reading the Bible and you don't quite see Jesus because you're kind of like you're in a, a big art gallery where there's a painting that is like 30 metres long and you're standing this close to the painting and all you can see is blue and you say this is the worst painting, it's just blue, it's boring until you take steps back and you stand and you see the whole 30 metre long canvas and you see oh that's a little bit of the sea but there's beautiful boats and there's people and there's animals and there's the sun and the moon and the stars or whatever else it might be in the sky and you see oh it's so much better than just that little bit of blue So sometimes you need to see this bigger story to see where Jesus is in that story or what he wants for you in your life. But the Bible is constantly pointing out who Jesus is, what he's like, and how he wants us to respond. And if you're reading the Bible and you're not sure where Jesus is, feel free to ask. Ah, If I can help, I will. But also ask God for help too. And keep on reading. Don't give up then and go, I don't understand this story. Keep on reading and it might become clear. Don't be embarrassed to ask. Even though I've done my theology degree, even though I read the Bible for a living, I still struggle with bits of it too. And I often have to go and ask others or read bits and say, help me understand this bit of the Bible too. If I need help, many of you need help, I'm sure we all need help. The whole of the Bible though points to Jesus. Now when I was preparing this, I realised I had four sermons worth of material, so strap in. But, (laughs) don't worry. We shall stop there. But a couple of closing comments um, to finish. But there's so much more that I could say this morning. The first thing I want to say is that um, last week we began um, small groups um, where we're looking on Sundays at a particular theme and we're exploring that in smaller groups throughout the week. It's not a Bible study, it's a chance to get to know each other and explore some of the theme in a way that's applicable to us wherever we are in our journey of faith. To those who went, I've heard great things and I hope you're encouraged by them. If you've not signed up yet, and there's groups on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursdays in the evenings and Thursdays um, at 1pm. If you missed the first week, don't worry, still time to sign up 
feel free to ask me and we'll slot you in somewhere. But if you are part of our small group this week, then you can maybe discuss these kind of things. What have you found difficult about reading the Bible? Or what bits have you really enjoyed? What's helped you to understand the Bible more? What stops you from reading it more? And as I say, I want to encourage you to come with questions about your Bible to your small groups if you're in them, or if not, feel free to ask me other times. Maybe you read something this week that really challenges you. And you're saying, why would God do that? Why is that in the Bible? Or some bits that just perplex you and confuse you. Feel free to ask your group leader if they can answer it. Great, if they can't, we'll come back to you in a few days' time after they look into it a bit more. And friends, if you're not much of a Bible reader, if you're honest about it and you're saying, my Bible, I think it might be somewhere in a shelf or in a box somewhere and it's grown dusty. If that's you, don't worry. There's grace for you today. Just like a friend, if you'd not spoke to them for a few months, that friend is not going to say, never speak to me again because you did not text me the last three months. They would love to get a text today or a phone call or a letter today. They'd love to hear from you again. In the same way, God is like that too. He's like that, um, that picture of the prodigal son and the father who says, come on back, come on back. God wants you to build on that relationship, wherever it is today, a bit more. Begin at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Make your way slowly through them, asking God to help you find Jesus in the Bible. And when you come to the Bible, as I say, don't come to learn information like a textbook. Come with a desire to really know Jesus, to find life in him, to follow him. If you come to the Bible because you think it's a textbook, you'll be bored stiff and your Bible reading will fizzle out. But come to the Bible and see it as a living, active text that wants to work in the depths of your soul to transform your life, to give you joy, life and fullness. Read it with hunger, passion and delight. If you want to know your Saviour more, get into the Word of God. If you want to know the one who gave you life and offers you everlasting life, let yourself be soaked and saturated within the pages of this book. The Bible is God's Word for you. It's a declaration of who he is, what he's like, and what he desires your life to be like. Discover Jesus. Read your Bible. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you have given us your word in all different kinds of formats, from those little picture Bibles for children and infants to the average Bible we have in our hands today. But Lord, we so often recognise that we let it grow dusty on our shelf or we come to it only when it's convenient. But Lord, we pray that we would come to it afresh today. That we would discover not like a textbook, but we would discover life within these pages. That we would discover the one who is the way, the truth and life. That we would find Jesus and fall more and more in love with him. And grow in faith and grow in fellowship with him. Becoming a disciple of his each and every day. So bless us with encouragement that we might read our Bibles more and more and discover more of Jesus. For we ask all of these things in his name. Amen. Amen. And Peter's going to lead us in prayer in a minute, but before we do so, we'll sing again. This time we sing Spirit of God.
Let's come before God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you hear prayer. We are finite and limited, yet you ask us to come to you in prayer for our needs and wishes. And wondrously, you work in and through our prayers. You wait until we ask and then you answer. This truly is a privilege and a responsibility. So we come to you with our prayers. We think of all those in our community who suffer, suffering in body or spirit or mind. Some of them are known to us and some are not, but no matter, we ask for your healing and comfort and that they might know that you are beside them. We ask for our troubled world we ask for peace in Palestine, in Ukraine, in Sudan, and in the Middle East more widely. But we also pray for those conflicts that don't get reported, or have passed from the news, but still go on. And we pray for peace between people, between ourselves. May we take seriously your promise that blessed are the peacemakers. We ask knowing that you will answer, and we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. We close our time together by standing and singing, Standing on the Promises.
promises of God and find life and joy through coming to know Jesus. And may God's blessing be with you from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, today and forevermore. Amen. 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 Please.